Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You are currently listening to the IPRO International Day of Women and Girls in Science. It is a three part webinar series, and today we are already on session three. It is really a fantastic opportunity for some of the women in science who are working in forestry and forest related uh, sections to have an opportunity to promote their work and to be a little bit on the spotlight. Unfortunately, we don't always have these opportunities in some countries where we still find that women are being repressed to a certain extent. But IUFRO is strongly driving equality for women, for women equality, even within their own organization. And this webinar series is just highlighting that as well. So we have a fantastic lineup. But first, what is IUFRO? So IUFRO is the International Union of Forestry. Uh, forest research organization and how does it work it has lots of science participation we have over 15,000 scientists who are part of our UFRO from 115 different countries and really the research and the networking opportunities that our UFRO provides in this framework is is quite good and in this case we ask um, people to become involved in the different divisions our UFRO has nine different Visions that encompass quite a broad range of different topics, as you can see on the screen, from silviculture to forest products to forest policy and economics. But the one that we are most interested in for today's session is the Division 7 called Forest Health. And within Forest Health, you get different sections. So you can see if you go onto the website and have a look at the IUFRO and the different divisions, here you can see all the different working group parties that go within the pathology section and the entomology section. And you, if you are interested in science and you're doing anything related to forestry and you're not really part of any of these working group parties yet, I encourage you to have a look at that. So if, for example, you might be working on vascular wool pathogens, there's a group that you can join that specifically is working on that. If you want to go a bit broader and you say, okay, well, I'm working on something on pest and disease in the southern hemisphere, there's a group that you can join as well. These groups get together and they have various meetings. So we do encourage you to, to participate. And how do you do this? Go onto the website, have a look at who the coordinators of those working group parties. Uh, ask them if you can become a member and if you can get involved. And so you can join us and participate in our UFRO. And that's exactly what Dr. Josephine Clifford did. She is now one of the leaders of the entomology group in Division 7 Forest Health. And she is the one that actually had the brainchild of this initiative, uh, spearheading the webinar series, organizing it together, getting all of these wonderful women to do their presentations. And so, Josephine, I'd just like to thank you particularly for driving this initiative with a little bit of help from your organizing committee to the people that you see there. I then, mean, because we're hosting a Tara and Fabi, I particularly want to thank Ms. Kira Lynn, who is currently a PhD candidate, who is sitting next to me, and she's also going to be co-hosting today's session. And then I'd also like to thank Dr. Felipe Velocchi, who um, not only is a great scientist, but he's here, who has volunteered to actually be our technical support. So thank you as well. But let's start off with our wonderful lineup of women scientists. This is uh, what we have on our schedule for today. Uh, different scientists from PhD candidates all the way to associate professor and professor from a wide range of different geographic uh, locations from the Philippines to Nepal to Australia. So we're in for a bit of a treat uh, regarding what's happening. So first of all, we are going to start with Ms. Swarati Ariel. She is a government forest officer in Nepal, where for the last 13 years, she has played a pivotal role in the management of natural resources. She is the co-initiator of the Female Foresters Network, where she significantly contributes to the network's objectives by providing training and men men mentorship to emerging female foresters. The contributions and leadership within this network underscore her commitment to the advancement of forestry practices and the empowerment of women in the profession. I think she will be a great start to our seminar sessions. Thank you. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for reaching out to us here in Nepal. And I think like I'll be more focusing on how females here have been working in forestry sector in Nepal. So it's about forest health, but we'll be also talking about the foresters health. So I would like to share about like the work that we have been doing for achieving gender equality in forest sector in Nepal. So I'd like to uh, present about our journey. So it's not me personally uh, presenting today. So, but it would be the group that we have. I'll be presenting it on behalf of Female Foresters Network here. So I would like to now share my screen. So basically like uh, forestry overall, it's more masculine. I think globally it happens to be so masculine and similar is the position here in Nepal. So you can see the established that 2071 in Nepal, like our calendar is quite ahead of the rest of the world. So we are now in 2018. So near about 10 years, almost it's been a decade that we started collaborating together and forming like working together for uh, for the gender issues. So now we have Female Foresters Network and it, it's uh, known as FFN. That's the short form that we use. So who are we basically? What are we doing? So the overall overview of FFN is it's a uh, network which works in women agency and women leadership. It advocates for inclusive, safe, and dignified workspace. Uh, so there are academia, there are government uh, organizations, non-government agencies, it's like private sectors, it's community people. So we work on all the sectors and basically the scope area that we have is like, we basically focus on same as women agency, it's about the leadership, we advocate for safe and dignified workspace, we do the collaboration and the, one of the major thing that we're doing is recognizing gender as the core business of forestry sector. So I would also like to share the journey, how we started. So before 2014, it was on an individual basis that everybody was working on gender equality. So it was in person, everybody, like it was on personal interest and everybody was trying to integrate gender in their work. But uh, like that was not giving that, uh, a bigger picture for gender equality. So it happened to be a personal effort of everybody working. So then uh, like few of us, we thought like maybe we need a network. So the few regional level gender workshops within the country that were conducted. And then out, out of that regional workshops that gave us the idea of how the females are working and what are their problems. Otherwise like, uh, before that, when a female raised some of the concerns, it was more like it's her personal problem or something. But when, but the outcomes of the regional level workshop that happened to be like the results where everybody was facing the similar problem, so it could not be a personal problem. So from that outcomes, we also did one national level workshop, and that happened to be the basis for our networking. So. After that, in 2017, we conceptualized Female Foresters Network and uh, like we had, we started organizing ourselves and networking through social media. Basically, we had Facebook, a uh, closed Facebook page, Facebook group where females would interact and like even in the messenger group, we would share our experience and we also like, because we are few females were, like, were working within the government sector. We happened to uh, show our presence in national level workshops of uh, like forest management workshops and everything. We started telling that focusing on uh, the agendas of female, we started showing our presence. And there's also Nepal Foresters Association that we have, that's the umbrella organization of all the foresters. So during its election, we did a campaign and we also did regular meetings, discussions, and uh, we also did an awareness campaign, which included basic gender sensitization trainings, we did dialogues and also media outreach. So this was the thing when this was the brainstorming phase of Female Foresters Network, and it was back in 2017. Then 
then in 2019, uh, that also happened to be the year of COVID, where COVID started. And we started institutionalizing the Female Foresters Network and also its scope and a working strategy. So we, in 2019, we had our own Facebook page named Female Foresters Network. Then after that, it's like, uh, then we started through Facebook page. We also had core group. We also had task team through which we uh, did uh, different uh, programs and uh, we also had like we also did collaboration with different organizations. Basically, it was the Recoft, uh, which is based in Thailand. So they helped they helped us with uh, a few technical assistance, like providing us the Zoom link through which we did various webinar series. Until now, we have done twenty three webinar series in the past two years. And we also did different dialogues. We prepared database of females and we did media outreach. And a major target for like the webinar series that was uh, the resource person would be the female. So that also worked as the breeze to uh, link the early career females with the female expertise in forestry sector. So I think out of 23 webinars that we conducted, almost all the webinars had females as the expertise. So, uh, so that happened to be a tool, and I think the lockdown time, the COVID time, despite the whole world was like everybody was sitting inside home, that happened to be a uh, a kind of blessing for female foresters network for the network develop because everybody had time and everybody was giving that time to like the discussion of how we can further collaborate, how we can do for the networking and also like with few resources, like just with one Zoom link, we could coordinate with all the females and like everybody sitting in their home with getting networked and they were talking to each other. That's how we started. And now like after 2019, we have like sponsored leadership, women leadership, and we are established network. So we are doing networking, like collaboration with different multiple stakeholders, and we also have developed female leaders. So what we're doing is like we have we are working on women agency in the leadership development and also networking. So we also started a leadership webbing program, which says like leadership accelerator program. And our target is to prepare 300 gender leaders, females in forest sector in Nepal. So with, and the first batch where there are 30 female gender leaders who have already passed out. Uh, so in uh, the first batch, they were given different trainings, like the trainings were basically the online trainings and the gender leaders, basically they are the early career females. So we did different webinar series and it were the females. Uh, the females from that, like the gender leaders, were conducting those webinar programs. So FFN provided a platform and provided an opportunity for the females uh, to like opportunity of conducting programs. Like they were uniting, they were uh, reaching out to experts. It it was the gender leaders, uh, the first batch of uh, leadership webinar, leadership accelerator program. So. They're giving the opportunities and like they conducted webinar programs, like and also did virtual trainings. We also did do trainings, physical trainings, and the gender leaders also had national and regional level exposures. So uh and those gender leaders were like we did the career coaching, mentoring. So we basically were providing a safe space, and uh that's how we did. And the other thing that FFN Female Foresters Network focuses is like we advocate for safe and dignified workspace because it's we also did one webinar uh, on tackling toxic masculinity culture in forestry sector. We all we also have done different training programs. We have done the orientation program and it uh, either it be in person or virtual. We have gone to the academia. We have like done the trainings in collaboration with institutes, Institute of Forestry here in Nepal. 
and we have also done psychosocial counseling we have done like formal even informal and informal discussions uh, we have talked about sexual harassment uh, that happens to be like quite prevalent in forestry sector and on personal level we have also supported on legal procedures with few of the cases that were reported and uh, this is basically what we have been doing on seven dignified workspace and the collaboration is with like we have collaboration with media networks we have collaboration with ministry of forest and environment and uh, also the international like non-government organizations the development partners and the women networks and community people we also are collaborating with male gender champions in forestry sector we are collaborating with academia collaboration with other networks and also having formal and informal discussions so and we are also doing policy dialogues that we did like this was done in collaboration with different stakeholders so the policy dialogues like national and international le national levels discussions uh we've been doing and you can see the different uh like where FFN's presence like basically that we have is we are using our Facebook page as we don't have the website and like it's like except the network that we have we don't have resources like we don't have the financial resources we collaborate with different stakeholders who help us like suppose when we are doing the webinars and for webinars it was just the zoom link and when we are doing in-person trainings, it would be the particular organization doing the logistic part, and it would be female foresters network focusing on the technical aspects. And that's how we did the programs. And um, we also did regular meetings because most of us, we are working within the government sector as well. So we had uh, like Dr. Radha Wagley, she was the senior most, uh, she was in the, senior position within the government. So like we'd conduct different trainings, even within the Ministry of Forest and Environment, different gender sensitization trainings were there through which we conducted um, the trainings and we gave trainings to uh, the, the government employees, uh, trainings to, so it was like basically reaching out to multiple stakeholders and also like, there were, we did the media outreach through like the media had uh, different medias and the uh, webinar programs, the webinar series. So that's how we have been working. And the results and learning points through the advocacy forum, like it's basically the, it's a network and basically we call it an advocacy forum. So there's some kind of like, we can see the change in uh, this time frame and the agency that we created. So we are the pioneer to have the discussion on behavioral aspects on gender, basically within the government sector here in Nepal. And we are also the one who, uh, within the government sector, within the bureaucracy, we are the ones, the pioneer ones who are having a difficult conversation. Like we are having a conversation on seven dignified workspace. We are having conversations on sexual harassment. We have been advocating for that. And that has created a sensitization, like that has created a kind of awareness because back in the initial days, we were uh, like people were telling us that we were defaming our organization. So from being told of like, from being called like you defaming the organization to uh, at the current scenario, the cases of sexual harassment being reported. So we can see the change that's been happened. And I think now at the current scenario, when we are like in the early 2024, nobody like whenever we talk about the workplace harassment, it's not like people are telling us that you're defaming the organization, rather like they're accepting that their cases exist and the cases have been reported. So we are having various dialogues and like, uh, so, that's one part we're working on the policies and and the other thing is we have the second cohort of the leadership program so the team 30 the first 30 batch 
that passed out and we have the second batch, like we did an open call and now we have 70 gender female leaders here in Nepal. So that's creating a change and preparing the institutes for being more gender sensitive and also preparing the agencies, the other agencies that we have there, like being ready for like bringing the change in the gender equality. So this is the leadership accelerator program that we did here in Nepal. So like, I don't want to go much deeper into this, but this is one of the major program that Female Foresters Network has been doing. And below you can see the picture where those are the gender leaders. And like we selected leaders and we did like, so basically there were 35, then after like, because uh, now we have like, like at the end of the two years, there are 30 because like few females, they were uh, abroad for their, for pursuing the master's degree. So uh, for the physical trainings, there were 30 and 30 leaders. So we did different trainings and we did career coaching and mentoring, like talked about job opportunities and doing good in job, facilitated in abroad studies and also did a regular mentoring program. And we also did psychosocial counseling, like we talked about tackling the biasness. We talked about like, what are the prevailing, what could be the different forms of sexual harassment. We have prepared a spectrum on sexual harassment and the, the training part and give them the national and regional level exposures to the females. So together, this was the physical training and you can also see the three gender leaders telling their viewpoints like the so that's how we have been working and yes i'd like to stop my presentation thank you for listening and we are working here and maybe in the regional level or even we can collaborate in the future so i'd like to say that female foresters is network is open to collaboration to uh, achieve the gender equality within the forestry sector, not only in Nepal, but globally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saraswati. Uh, that, that's really impressive what you've managed to do in the last nine years. And um, it seems as you've built up such a network and integrated into the whole of Nepal. What is really, um, I, I think it's quite an achievement as well, is that you've managed to get the ear of the government. And that's always something that might be quite difficult to get into. And the fact that you're already doing training there and that you're engaging with the government at that level is uh, uh, quite impressive. And, and it's good to see that that is happening. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions for anybody online? Anna? You're welcome to ask your question. Hi, that's really impressive work. I was wondering if you have tried to network with people in other countries, like with similar organizations to see what has also worked for them and maybe do like some sharing of the case studies and all the things you have been doing. Because I also come from a developing country. Right now I'm based in Europe, but we also have gender issues and also the financial part is always a huge huge, huge problem when you don't have the, the funds for this. So I was wondering if you have done some international networking aside from this webinar and other things. Yeah, I think like, uh, I think even today's, uh, today's sharing, that could be like, it, it has opened an uh, area for collaboration in the future. So till now, like we have done some regional level uh, networking and I think we are basically focused with the females within Nepal so but uh, I think like because even how we got like into today's program was somebody from Nepal was engaged in today's program and they knew about female foresters network and that's how like got the opportunity to share about our experience work experience with all of you today so I think like uh, we should collaborate because forestry it's so uh, masculine overall like globally it's too masculine so I think like to achieve the gender equality we can definitely collaborate in the upcoming days but till now I think we are more limited within our country and 
because like uh, it's not in registered organization it's like everybody what everything what we did was more voluntary so because i work for government and i'm not like the government has not given me any written uh thing to work on gender so this is the extra thing that i have been doing and similar is with my other colleagues like they have given their full time for uh, the network so uh, i think like in future we can definitely collaborate and i would be happy to like not only me but on behalf of female foresters network would be very much happy to collaborate in the upcoming days yeah, I think that um, you have a winning recipe and um, everybody always share the winning recipe. And so yeah. I think that um, you know other countries could take up this sort of initiative and, and drive it in their own countries as well. So that's great. So, um, Ashwati will be in uh, the chat room if anybody would like to ask uh, her some more questions. The breakout room, thank you. All right, so next up we have our next speaker, which is Dr. Gianni Biajanathan, um, or Jenny. So uh, she is a senior research officer at the Forest Plantation Program of Forest Research Institute in Malaysia. Her expertise lies in the area of soil science, looking at things such as soil chemistry, precision agriculture, and plant nutrition management, just to name a few. She is currently the vice chair of the Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils, or the FAO. And she's a recipient of Excellent Service Medal of 2022 under the Public Service Department of Malaysia. She also uh, was awarded the Outstanding Women's Researcher by the Venus International Foundation. And we really look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Diani. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair Irene, as well as your team for the uh, presentation. So allow me to share my presentation now. Let me just getting it shared. Are you able to view my slide? Yes, we can see it perfectly. All right, thank you. So uh, good day to everyone present here. My name is Janie Vijanathan. I'm attached with the Forest Research Institute of Malaysia. And this uh, paper is actually on the emerging role of soil health in sustaining uh, tropical forest ecosystems. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to share a brief introduction about uh, myself, uh, as well as the institute that I come from, Forest Research Institute Malaysia, sprouts across 544 hectares uh, in the heart of uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, the capital. We do various uh, research and we have been established since 1920s. So from one research station in 1920, we have actually expand, expanded to more than 10. You can see that we are all over the six states in Peninsula Malaysia, looking at uh, various research focus as well as forest species themes. Uh, in our division, uh, in our organization, we are divided into five different uh, divisions, uh, whereby all these divisions are overseen by the research planning division. And I come from the forestry biotechnology division, uh, where my branch is soil management. So usually when we speak about soil health, um, most of our perspectives are actually screwed towards uh, agriculture when we want to look at the uh, minimizing disturbance and maximizing living roots. Uh, let's uh, bear in mind, in order for a healthy soil to sustain a vital ecosystem, we also have to look at the soil physical, chemical, and the biological properties that I have uh, put in here in the slides in order to provide and sustain for plants, animals, and humans. So just like uh, the context of soil health, when we talk about sustainable forest management, we are trying to see how actually the planet uh, profits as well as people can actually coexist in order to reduce uh, forest degradation as well as undesirable effects which will uh, affect the forest. So uh, by combining soil health and soil uh, sustainable forestry. Uh, lately, the uh, FAO has come up with this info poster on looking at how healthy soils actually provide for many different fu functions such as flood and climate regulation, 
uh, provision of food fiber and fuel, carbon sequestration, which is very important in forestry, nutrient cycling, and many other more. So in Frame, what we have done is that we have uh, put in our efforts in various uh, research themes, especially on rehabilitation, conservation, urban forest, agroforestry, uh, SFM, as well as Red Plus. And the next few slides, I'll be showing you what are the efforts that we are actually doing in keeping our soils healthy. So in sustainable forest man management, we have uh, actually introduced reduced impact logging, and this actually reduces carbon losses at about uh, 21 to 46% compared to conventional practices. Uh, besides uh, reducing carbon, it has also been deemed uh, increased carbon storage, protecting our soil water biodiversity, allowing a healthy growth of forests and many other functions. Uh, besides that, we have also gone into coastal rehabilitation. You can see the picture here in year 2007 and 2015, how innovative planting techniques have actually uh, transformed this area into a vegetation of mangroves. Uh, and we are looking at carbon assessment and stocks, uh, looking at uh, forestry indices, which actually helps in sustainable forest management. Uh, we also teach our municipal council on how we can protect the soil in urban forestry and also look at uh, various uh, systems uh, such as payment for environmental uh, ecosystem services and how we can look at for the recreation as well as the reduced impact degradation and deforestation for uh, payment services. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, our team in FRIM has done a lot of work in uh, computing as well as compiling a lot of information on uh, in situ biodiversity conservation. This is already a boon for keeping the soil healthy as well as not to be cleared for other land use purposes. Uh, in terms of uh, natural products, we have worked hand in hand in developing guidance and reference materials on what type of soil and what type of management, good management practices that we can actually use uh, in interventions of media in order to increase the production of natural products. Uh, we are also uh, constantly uh, supporting the campaign by the ministry on 100 million trees planting, uh, whereby we try to initiate this within the communities as well, how they can actually come into the picture and help in planting trees across the nation. Okay, some pictures that I would like to share here on the types of uh, afforestation strategies that we are doing is that uh, we have turned uh, extinct tailings. You can see the picture uh, on year 2000 as well as 2012, how barren it was and how we have turned it into a forest with a span of 10 to 20 years. Uh, this requires a lot of patience and time as well as effort. And uh, how we have done it has been recorded in the books that we have published, which can help the industry players in rehabilitation and afforestation. <clears throat> I'm also very proud to share with you today that uh, Malaysia has actually nominated my office uh, frame for the UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, because this is one area which is very special. It was... Uh, vegetable gardens in the early 1900s and has been transformed into a fully fledged planted forest now. Uh, besides doing efforts by ourselves, we also teach our industry players, mainly from the Malaysia Timber Industry Board, whereby we had a uh, we had a course for them lately in conjunction with the World Soil Day on teaching them how to sample soils from forests, how to look out the, their trees, and also do uh, laboratory analysis for their uh, data and interpret on how to manage their uh, forest plantation much more successfully. So moving back into the coastal areas, uh, like how I showed you before this, uh, we have done a lot of effort 
in rehabilitating of coastal uh, wetlands. In 2009, uh, this is my staff. He has gone in at least uh, waist deep. And in 2019, you can see how much we have transformed this area in order to put in green cover here. Uh, in order to assess this, we have done uh, assessment of uh, soil quality in these areas on chemical pro properties. Besides uh, chemical properties, we have also looked at the varying, uh, uh, varying differences of soil physical as well as uh, biological properties. Uh, we have done some work on the metagenomics part of mangroves. We were looking at what are the bacteria doing there? How are they playing an important role in uh, nutrient cycling or even uh, carbon management? Of course, uh, whatever we do, uh, it's just not for, uh, for one side. What we try to do is that we try to bring this out to the community frontier. We teach the community among us, uh, around us, our organization, as well as outstation, on how they can uh, use various techniques and guidelines in order to revegetate areas uh, which are barren, as well as uh, include them in citizen, citizen science projects, as well as teach them how they can be self-independent in doing their own part in uh, making the soils healthy. We have also done a lot of work on measurements of carbon stocks and fluxes in peatlands, may it be in lowlands as well as in mountain forests. Uh, we continue to do this and we have found a lot of uh, information and data looking at how uh, mountain ecosystems can actually play an important role in carbon sequestration. And uh, the CRICT map here actually shows you uh, the amount of carbon at varying sites, uh, especially in the side slope, in the peak, as well as the uh, lower peaks, uh, lower land, uh, to actually see where can we use our decision-making system in order to conserve the areas which are high in carbon. Knowing that the demand for food has increased, we always look at how we can actually balance uh, food security with environmental protection. So uh, there has been a lot of various agroforestry models which can be a win-win situation besides providing cover for the soil, uh, retaining moisture, reducing temperature. Uh, they may also provide intermediate income for the farmers uh, while awaiting their perennial crops to mature uh, and harvest the trees from there. So having said that, uh, Malaysia is very determined and also uh, going towards uh, the management on reducing deforestation, sustainable forest management and conservation, whereby uh, at national level, we are looking at how Firstly, on moving on to higher tiers for data reporting, especially for the greenhouse gas inventories for UNFCC. And secondly, how can we uh, create uh, monetary values for our uh, forests? Uh, example that I've given you here in this black box on how we try to estimate the carbon uh, change, the annual carbon stock change, and how we can actually finance this according to the uh, current carbon price. Uh, we also engage uh, various ministries, also agencies, uh, on moving forward, how we can actually work hand in hand together, not only in FRIM with other ministries, uh, in order for us to make this uh, realization uh, better for our country. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I would like to share is that Soil is an important and vital part for forestry, especially when you're doing the site preparation, you have to understand the soil properties very well to minimize soil degradation and retain the cover crops uh, before you even remove everything. And then when you do your interventions, whether it's restoration, reforestation, afforestation, or agroforestry, uh, bear in mind that you're actually helping to enhance the biodiversity uh, of flora and fauna here 
we are promoting mutual benefits for crown and the roots. And by applying good agricultural and forestry practices in silvicultural management, such as uh, utilization of minimal uh, fertilization and using biomass byproducts as soil uh, ameliorations, we are reducing the cost as well as the pollution uh, that may interfere with the uh, watershed or even the uh, uh, water catchments area. So uh, all this that we are doing is actually to create a sustainable forest, uh, which may have uh, societal benefits, cultural heritage, uh, income generation for the farmers, uh, and we will also enhance the carbon sequestration potential. And we also need to see how our sustainable forests can actually fit into the circular economy. So uh, with that, I would like to um, end my presentation. I thank uh, UFRO for uh, organizing this webinar and FRIM for giving me the support for the platform for growth in science. Uh, some of the work that I've shown here are part of my uh, colleagues work from FRIM, as well as our ministry for setting the directions uh, of research. Uh, Trima Kase, this is my recent uh, picture of me during the World Wetland Day, where I was actually in the wetland sampling uh, in the mangroves. Uh, we hope that more women soil scientists, uh, women scientists will join uh, initiatives uh, in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, Jenny. That was um, intriguing. Is there any questions online? If not, I have a, um, a question. Based on your different soil types, do you do soil site matching with the crops that you grow? Uh, yes, we do do that because we have uh, different soils, uh, such as inland soils, coastal soils. We also have marginal lands here. So usually uh, the stations that I showed you uh, sprawled across our you know, peninsula map. Uh, that those are the areas that we do the soil and uh, species site matching in order for us to determine the growth and the yield. And we will, uh, based on the results, we will recommend, recommend it to the timber industry for them to choose what species goes where. Quite interesting. Yeah, I know the peatlands are quite a, quite a challenging soil type. Thank you. Thank you so much. So anybody online checking the chat box? If we have no more questions, please remember that there is the breakout rooms. Um, but if there are no more questions, I think we can move on to the next presentation with the interest of time. Thank you, Jenny. Please uh, meet Jenny in the breakout room. So from Nepal to Malaysia, now we move on to Australia. And here we have Dr. Anna Hopkins, who is a conservation biologist and fungal ecologist at the Edith Cowan University in Western Australia, where she co-leads the Molecular Ecology and Evolution Group, and has experience working with soil microbes, plant-fungal fauna interactions, eDNA, and plant-fungal uh, pathogens, and mainly working in the eucalypt space and, and as well as pines. Her current research focuses primarily on using molecular tools to answer broad ecological and management-based questions. Thank you, Anna, for to your talk. We can see your screen. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction, Irene. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along. Um, I'd like to start my presentation today by acknowledging that um, I'm on Wajak Noongar country and paying respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, what I'm going to present for you today is some work. It's a relatively new project that we're doing and um, I thought that it would be a nice chance to share some new and exciting developments that are happening here in, um, in Western Australia as opposed to presenting something that um, is a bit more of a developed project that's more complete. So I hope that that's okay with everyone. Um, 
I also want to point out that this, what I'm pre presenting today is a research project that's being carried out at the university. So it's not um, a government research, um, response to an invasive pathogen or anything like that. It is um, primarily a research project. There are other things going on in the government departments here, but that's not what I'm presenting today. Um, so I'm going to talk about preparing for murk rust in Western Australia. And what I'm talking about primarily is um, the work of one of our PhD students, Eric Kumiazare, um, who's a PhD student here at ECU. And I thought this was a nice opportunity to talk about this work because Eric is being supervised by me and a fabulous panel of other women scientists. Um, you can see here on the screen, so Mary Hanson, Christina Lempson and Kylie Ireland. Um, so he's a very lucky man. And um, we're also working in collaboration with other um, forest pathologists and um, botanists here in Western Australia and throughout Australia on this project. So some of you are probably familiar with myrtle rust, um, also known as rubber rust or um, uh, various other types of rust. It's caused by an invasive rust pathogen, um, Osteococcinia sidei, and um, this is a rust pathogen that was um, first discovered causing disease in Brazil in the 1880s um, on guava, and um, has since host jumped onto eucalypts in Brazil and has then been found um, in all many different parts of the world, um, causing disease on um, plants in the Myrtaceae family. So Myrtaceae, many of you are probably familiar with. They're a family of very important um, plants, both economically and ecologically. So they include um, things like eucalypts that are planted throughout the world for pulp and paper in plantations, but they also include things um, that are planted as amenity trees, so eucalypts again, or other Myrtaceae species. Um, and in Australia particularly, there are a lot of native Myrtaceae um, so the fact that this was a pathogen that was causing disease on Myrtaceae and on quite a wide range of different Myrtaceae um, was something of concern in Australia. Um, the current host range for Myrtle Rust is about 450 tree species. They um, have a range of different disease impacts um, from very severe to a lot less severe. And about 375 of these different species are found in Australia. The disease impacts, as I said, range depending on the different species that um, is infected, um, but they can range from um, minor kind of defects through to serious tree decline, crown loss, um, and even tree death and seedling loss. So you can see some of the impacts in the images here. Um, it is a very pretty pathogen. It does cause these beautiful yellow pustules um, on infected leaves and shoots. Um, but then can cause um, death, particularly of the growing parts of the plant. So in Australia, myrtle rust was first, Osteopaxinia sidio was first discovered in 2010, just north of Sydney. Um, and it very rapidly spread up and down the coast. So you can see in this figure here, um, the red is where um, the pathogen is now detected causing disease. Um, and so it's found throughout most of the east coast of Australia now. Um, it was found uh, in Darwin in northern Australia in 2015. And then just recently um, in 2022, it was found in northern Western Australia. So for those of you not familiar with Australia, um, this is Western Australia here. It's obviously the western part of Australia. So this is the state here. Um, but as you can see at the moment, apart from that very um, minor incursion in the north of Western Australia, myrtle rust isn't actually present, Australopathenia sidia is not actually present anywhere else in Western Australia at the moment. Um, so because we have lots and lots of um, native ecosystems that have a large number of myrtaceae in Western Australia, this is something that we're particularly concerned about. Um, you also notice that the distribution of myrtle rust is primarily up and down the coast, and that's because it prefers moist, damper environments. Um, and central Australia is largely um, desert, quite sparse, quite dry, and quite hot, so it's a very unsuitable environment for myrtle rust. Um, and this means there is a really big land bridge between um, throughout the centre of Australia 
um, that prevents myrtle rust from spreading easily from the east coast of Australia to the west coast, um, especially as the prevailing winds tend to go from west over to east too. So it's less likely to spread um, in prevailing winds over that many thousands of kilometres. So um, we've been thinking in Western Australia about myrtle rust for some time and hoping that it doesn't come here. And I just wanted to share with you some of the um, modelling that's been done to look at whether myrtle rust may in fact cause a problem here. So um, in figure A here, you can see the um, suitability, the climate suitability modelling for myrtle rust in Western Australia. You can see that most of the, the state um, is likely to be unaffected by myrtle rust or the climate isn't particularly suitable. But in the southwest corner of Western Australia, there are some areas that are um, thought to have suitable climates. Um, this southwest corner of Western Australia is a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and you can see in figure B here, um, that indicates the number of different species of myrtaceae that are possible hosts for myrtle rust in this area. So unfortunately, the suitable climatic area does overlap quite strongly with areas where there are lots and lots of suitable hosts. Um, oh, you can see up here just where the, um, the Kimberley location of myrtle rust is. So, um, all this led us to thinking about what the potential impact of myrtle rust might be if it does come to Western Australia. Uh, I think the most likely pathway that it might come is through movement of goods and services um, from the east coast of, uh, of Australia through to Western Australia. There are quarantine um, restrictions in place, so no movement of myrtaceous seed, for example, from the east coast of Australia to Western Australia. And Western Australia does maintain its own biosecurity border for a variety of different reasons, not just myrtle rust. But even still, it's possible that at some time myrtle rust will come to Western Australia. So what will the impacts be? The project that we're doing uh, looks at three different elements of the potential impact of myrtle rust in Western Australia. So the first one is to get a better understanding of which West Australian uh, Myrtaceae species are susceptible to the pathogen. So there are a number of species that have already been tested. Um, some of the Camelosiums, for example, some of the Melaleucas have been tested and are known to be susceptible to, um, to myrtle rust. But there are a large number of Myrtaceae species that are uh, we just don't know much about how susceptible they might be. Um, there are in the biodiversity hotspot in the southwest of Western Australia, there are over um, 800 to 1,000 species of Myrtaceae alone. So there's a lot of different species that we could potentially examine. So we, in our project, we've just selected about 20 species that are species that are more common that might provide a green pathway for spread of myrtle rust um, if they are susceptible to it. And so we're going to be testing them. Uh, just a quick biosecurity note, we're not going to be testing them here in Western Australia, even though we do have really good quarantine facilities, we're actually going to be doing that um, on the east coast in Brisbane, um, just in case you're worried about that. So the second thing that we're interested in, we're going to move from looking at a range of different host species to moving into looking at one particular host species and looking at that in a little bit more detail. And the species that we've selected is the um, West Australian peppermint tree, Agonis flexuosa. Um, this is a widespread endemic um, myrtaceous species. And we've chosen it because um, not very much is known about it, but it is planted quite widely as an amenity tree. It has quite high biodiversity value and um, it is grown also in the, on the east coast of Western Australia where it is found to be susceptible to myrtle rust. So we want to understand a little bit more about that particular species. Uh, and the third part of this project is really to understand how myrtle rust might impact the urban tree populations in Western Australia. So around Perth, the capital of Western Australia, and also around some of the other larger city areas. Um, so Perth is located in that southwest corner of Western Australia in the biodiversity hotspot. And lots and lots of myrtaceae species are planted as amenity trees throughout Perth, um, including bonus flexuosa that I previously mentioned. So it's really important for us to understand how myrtle rust might impact that urban tree population. 
And as well as that, we can use this part of the project to try and understand um, what the different pathways of spread might be around um, high risk sites to see whether um, the myrtle rust might be able to spread very easily um, if it's brought into Western Australia. So for example, we're having a look around the airport as a high risk site where there's lots of movement of cargo and people who might bring in spores on their clothes, for example. Um, we're looking at the trees around that area to understand uh, whether or not they might provide really successful pathways for um, the pathogen to spread from the airport. So I'm not going to talk about all three of these different aspects of the project. I'm just going to zoom in on one and I'm going to talk a little bit more about our examination of um, the West Australian peppermint tree, Agonis flexuosa. Um, so as I said, Agonis flexuosa is the West Australian peppermint tree. It is endemic to southwest Western Australia. It is often found in coastal areas, often in quite damp areas, so perfect kinds of environments for myrtle rust. And it's thought to be quite genetically diverse across its native range. When you look at the morphology of the tree, you can often see that you get small shrubby varieties and big tree varieties in different parts of its range. And it spans quite a large area of the southwest of Western Australia from the kind of cooler south coast regions right through to north of Perth, where it's a bit warmer and drier. Um, some preliminary uh, genetic work just on the amenity plantings around Perth itself indicated that there was quite a lot of genetic diversity within um, the population. So that's something we want to look at a little bit more. Uh, as I said before, it's also quite ecologically important. It's a really important habitat for the Western um, ringtail possum that you can see just up in the top left hand corner of the slide here. Um, that's an endangered species in Western Australia and it uses the West Australian peppermint as uh, a nesting and denning site. So they live in those trees quite often, but there are lots and lots of other um, animal species that also use the peppermint tree as um, their homes. It's also widely planted as an amenity tree throughout Australia and throughout Western Australia. And there are a number of different commercial varieties that have been um, bred of this. So there's one particularly popular one called After Dark, which has some nice kind of dark purplish foliage. And that's quite highly sought after as an amenity tree, but it's also known to be quite susceptible to myrtle rust. So there's some uncertainty around um, what variation there might be in susceptibility to myrtle rust uh, amongst those different uh, commercial plantings as well. So in this project, we're going to do four different things. One of the first ones is to look at any genetic variation among provenances of different, um, different native populations of Agonis flexuosa across its native range, but also to look at some of the commercial cultivars as well and see how genetically diverse they are and um, get a really good understanding of that genetic diversity within the population. Combined with that, we're also going to look at variations in host susceptibility across the native range of the species, um, with a particular view to trying to identify different provenances uh, that might be less susceptible to myrtle rust and might provide good genetic material if we go down the route of later doing a breeding program to um, breed some more genetically resistant um, cultivars or um, just to inform how we might be able to, to plant resistant um, varieties of this species. As well as that, um, our student Eric is doing a lot of work on the phenology of um, Agonis. Uh, I mentioned earlier that myrtle rust uh, particularly attacks the actively growing parts of the tree. Uh, so the new shoots and the new foliage might be um, active in the environment and so it might be more susceptible. And then the other thing that we're doing is just looking at what other stem and leaf pathogens um, are found on Agonis flexuosa. No one's really done much of this kind of work before. And so we want to really be able to make sure that um, if Australopuxinia cidii does come to Western Australia, we can distinguish it from um, the different signs and symptoms of other stem and leaf pathogens that might be found. 
um, on a gonus. So overall, we want to get a really good picture of what the impact of mercury dust might be on this particular species that's so ecologically important, but also potentially provide some clues to how we might be able to um, use breeding tools or other things to maintain a really resilient population of this species going into the future. The last thing I just wanted to talk to you about briefly was a larger project that I'm working on with my colleagues, Dr. Mary Hansen and um, Dr. Christina Lempson, and that's looking at urban trees um, in the future. We're doing this project in collaboration with some of our local councils and also with the Conservation and Biodiversity Research Centre here at ECU. And basically the idea of the project is to help the different local councils uh, select suitable amenity trees for planting um, that will still be sustainable in the future. So we're considering things like what current pests and pathogens present in Western Australia and in the Perth region and what different trees might be susceptible to them. So at the moment, for example, in Perth, we have an outbreak of the polyphagous shot hole borer that's currently under some quarantine restrictions and um, some biosecurity actions. And there are a large number of our amenity trees that are susceptible to, to that beetle and also to the pathogen that it um, transports. So um, we're trying to think about what impacts that might have in our amenity tree selection. And then other future pests and pathogens, so things like myrtle rust. So a lot of the plantings around Perth at the moment are Myrtaceae species, and so we're thinking about whether that's the best option going into the future. We're not just thinking about pests and pathogens, though. We're thinking about other things too. So we're also thinking about um, considering the impact climate change might have on our amenity tree selection into the future. Um, my colleague, Mary Hansen, is very interested in pollen allergens. Um, some amenity trees, things like olives and things produce pollen that a lot of people are very allergic to. So um, that's part of the consideration as well. And then also about different cultural and social values that these amenity trees might have. So altogether, we're um, aiming to produce a tool that uh, different councils in our local area might be able to use to make decisions about what trees to plant on our roadsides and in um, our gardens and things going into the future that will lead to much more sustainable urban forestry in the future. So that's everything I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'd really like to thank you for, for um, inviting me to speak. And I'd like to thank Irene for hosting the seminar today. Um, I'd like to thank all the different people who are working on different parts of this project. My contact details are here on the slide if you would like to get in touch with me and I will jump into the chat room shortly. Um, thanks very much, Irene. Great, thanks, Anna. Um... Becky Gandhi from New Zealand. At, uh, are you from a meeting in Portugal? She said that Australia to the eyes most devastating plant patch. Quite brave in saying that amongst all of the Bartopter group as well. And the reason she said this is because this is a pathogen that actually causes species extinction. So you can't really yes. argue with it. So it's, it's really, really important. And I think that it's great to see that you are continuing to do the work and that uh, this, kind of, this kind of studies are, are very important to do uh, as well. So my question to you, Anna, is that we know that there are various biotypes of the SDI. And considering that you are in the DNA space and, and looking at molecular markers, are you considering uh, every night again, screening to see that you still only have the one biotype in Australia? Um, I'm not doing that work at the moment, but I understand other people are. Um, so at the moment, because we don't have myrtle rust here in Western Australia at the moment, we're not at that point. Um, but I understand that other people in other parts of Australia are doing that screening to understand what different biotypes we have. Hopefully only the one still. Um, but yeah, remains to be seen, unfortunately. Um, but it's a really good question. I think that's something we definitely need to keep an eye on, Irene. Yes, because um, just because we've got the pathogens in our countries doesn't mean that we should relax some biosecurity. We've seen that in our, in our country as well. Are there any questions um, from the audience? We have one question from Chloe. Chloe, you're welcome to ask Hi. a question. 
Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for your talk, Anna. That was really interesting. Um, and it's really great to see work being done in anticipation rather than sort of damage control once a, a pathogen has um, arrived to a new place. I was wondering, and I know that this isn't um, a theme that you talked about uh, this time, but if you were testing whether some eucalypt species from Western Australia uh, could be susceptible to it, because I know that the Jara forests are dying back because of Phytophthora and drought, I think mainly, but um, I was wondering if that could be an additional concern for them too. That's a really good question, Chloe. Thanks for asking that. Um, in a different part of my life, I do a lot of work on that Jarrah dieback in the Jarrah forest, particularly looking at soil microbes. So I'm very familiar with what you're talking about. Um, there have been a number of the different eucalypt species that have been tested from Western Australia. There was quite a big study looking at Mary a little while ago, looking at different provinces of Mary and susceptibility there. Um, and we haven't specifically in our study focused on the eucalypts because um, that's just not where we were heading. We wanted to, to do some slightly different things. There are so many choices for different species that you could look yeah. at um, at the moment. Yeah. So a lot of the main eucalypts have already been tested, um, but there's still lots and lots of possibilities. There are lots and lots of species that we do need to test still. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Thanks for your question, Chloe. Is anyone else? Good, thank you, Anna, and please uh, join Anna in the breakout room. Thank you. All right, thank so you. once our next speaker, it's uh, Wei Chu Ma. So Wei Chu received her PhD in forestry protection from the College of Forestry uh, from the Northeast Forestry University in 2023. Uh, she is now a postdoctoral fellow where she's working on insect olfactory uh, molecular mechanisms and the development of insect odor receptor derived peptide biosensors. So, um, oh, thank you. Your screen. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. It's an honor to be able to participate in this conference and share my research. My name is Ma Wei Chao, a postdoctoral fellow at Northeast Forestry University in China. My research interests are insect chemical ecology. My re main research direction is to analyze the molecular mechanism of insect olfaction, construction and application of insect olfactory protein derived peptide biosensors. The title of the report I'm bringing today is the prospects of insect or receptor derived peptide biosensors. The quartet is divided to uh, four main reports, background, methods, results, and acknowledgements. Uh, let me, first of all, let me briefly introduce the peripheral olfactory system of insects. How do insects smell odors? Odor binding proteins bind to odors and transport them to the vicinity of dendritic membrane of olfactory neurons. And the odor receptors located on the neural membrane recognize the odors and convert this chemical signal into an electrical signal to the central nervous system, which then guides the insect to make behavioral responses, such as courtship, locating hosts, and finding of the position sites. Due to the selectivity and sensitivity of insect odor receptors, more and more biosensors are using insect odor receptors as a class of sensing elements. To put it simply, the insect ORs are expressed by cell lines. With expression and purification, the insect OR proteins are obtained, and then these proteins are attached to the liquid-like layer, similar to the cell membrane structure, and the insect odor receptor sensor is constructed by combining uh, field effect transistors and other technologies to connect to the sensor. 
these sensors can specifically identify volatile organic compounds, but they can only function in a liquid environment due to the nature of proteins that need to remain functional in buffers. Based on these studies, we wondered if it was possible to use the sex pheromone receptors of pests to build a class of biosensors that could detect gases sex pheromones to monitor the popular population dynamics of pests. At present, at present, the existing methods of monitoring pests are actually very mature, as the traditional method is to use sex pheromone traps, first trap them and then manually count them, which is accurate and effective, but it consumes manpower. In addition, oh, sorry. In, in addition, many automobiles automatic counting systems have emerged through infrared shooting and image recognition technologies. Now I will introduce how we do it. Basically, it's necessary to predict the ligand binding sites of the receptor and then design a peptide fragment containing the binding sites since size 8, attach it to the sensor and test the response of these peptide biosensors to the target order to clarify its function. The first is the sensitive substance, that is how to design the order receptor derived peptide. According to the previous research, we infer that the functional domain of the odor receptor is located in the transmembrane domain, coupled with the fact that the transmembrane domain is a simple alpha helical structure. So we only predicted the structures of the transmembrane domain. Molecular docking technology was used to predict the ligand binding sites. Based on the docking results, we designed peptide sequences with a less of 9 to 14 animals, uh, aminos containing ligand binding sites defined as ORP and synthesized these peptides. The next part is the biosensor, which is simply to use the NCL method and adsorption to connect ORPs and uh, carboxylated single arm carbon nanotubes to the interjected electrodes. We use resistance recorder to test the response of the sensor to a gaseous substance. And the intensity of the reaction is determined by the rate of change of resistance. All reactions are carried out in a closed test chamber. Next, I would like to share some of our results. Uh, using cotton bollworm as an example, it's well known that uh, cotton bollworm is an um, various agricultural pest that has attracted much attention worldwide. It damages cotton. The sex pheromone recognition medium of cotton bollworm is very solid, so we first chose this pest for research. Based on the existing reports, we screen out four uh, sex pheromone receptors of cotton bollworm. And uh, um, then, then we uh, struck, uh, we obtained the structure, tertiary structures of the transmembrane domains of the four sex pheromone receptors of cotton borum. And the, the structures were predicted by homology uh, modeling. 
uh, molecular docking technology was used to predict the ligand binding sites. This table presents the prediction results of ligand binding sites. A total of six ORPs were ob obtained. We attached these six peptides to the sensor and uh, tested the response of their corresponding pheromones. As shown in the figure, we have successfully built some sensors that can test the gases pheromones. Taking SP1, the main sex pheromone of cotton borworm, as an example, the detection limit was as low as 10 ppb, and the detection range could reach the range of 10 ppb to 10 ppm. At the same time, we tested the specificity of the sensors using the plant volatiles. And as shown in figure F, these sensors have good specificity. To further clarify the potential of these biosensors, we tested their responses to live Borworms and uh, showed that it could detect the release of sex pheromones from as few as one female borworm in a 22 liter test chamber. Interestingly, we also found that the release of sex pheromones by cotton borworm is regulated by light, uh, as shown as in Figure C. Uh, the release of sex pheromones of cotton borrow will not stop if the dark period is continuous and the release of will stop when the dark ends. So, as a result, our sensors can be used to study the release rhythms of certain volatiles in sex in insects. The findings were published in the journal SSSers. In addition, we have built sensors to monitor low-cost aggregation pheromones, aggregators, uh, locusts rely on the release of aggregation pheromones to uh, congregate their own kind, which in turn causes damage. Previously, researchers identified the aggregation pheromone of locusts as 4VA, and the locusts relied on OR35 to recognize 4VA. Based on this research, we have successfully constructed ORP sensors that monitor 4VA. Based on this research, uh, it the sensors can detect as few as one greatish great great uh, rares locust in the in lab. Uh, we have also built sensors that can monitor the damage caused by the larvae of American white moths to mulberry trees. Uh, these sensors can detect one American white moth, a uh, third in star larvae feeding on uh, mulberry trees. Uh, therefore, we have applied the molecular mechanism of insect olfaction combined with molecular docking and biosensor technology. The sensors can detect gaseous sub substances specifically sensitively dynamic at the real time, which has certain monitoring potential. However, it has not yet reached the level of application in the field. Compared with traditional monitoring methods, our method does not require trap before counting and for some migratory pests. It may be earlier for it may be earlier and more timely. Finally, uh, thank you for uh, thank you all for your patience. My spoken English is so poor, sorry. Okay, thank you. So, um, Elisa, won't you ask your question, please? No, I have a, I have a question uh, because I understand the um, 
And the fact that the sensor is very important for monitoring, but do you have um, also in your sensor is it calibrated to understand how many insects are present in the field or not? Um, because if you detect the sex pheromone, uh, we don't have an idea of like how many insects female are present. So I was wondering if you can also estimate how many insects are present and if it's up like like if the threshold is like um yeah and after you can you can do your 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 pest management control i don't know if i'm clear on that sorry can you read it okay so what i'm going to suggest is that um have a look in the chat box because she has written her question in the chat box and then one of the two of you break away in the break room and you can chat further then as well. So we're going to continue with our next speaker. <laughs> and we have uh, Anya Banos, and she is from Mexico. She is originally an agronomist and she was a project manager at an agrochemicals company. She has then since moved on and did a master's in plant health in Spain and France under a master's Erasmus Plus scholarship. And then she decided to continue, and she's currently a PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Germany. She has been studying the gut microbial community of the Eurasian spruce bark beetle. And Anna, I must say, I'm just loving your background picture. And uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Take it away. Okay, thanks for the super kind introduction. Uh, I'm Anna, as you already said, I'm from Mexico. Right now I'm in Germany doing my, my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology. So it's really um, not such applied research, it's more on the fundamental research, but it's uh, very relevant, the most relevant forest pest we have in Europe. So, uh, today I'm going to share a little bit about my PhD work and some perspectives of what we can learn from this. So here you see an image of a uh, forest in Sud Thuringen, so in the region where we are conducting the research, and all the clearances that you can see in these forests are because all the spruce trees have been removed after the attack of the beetle that I have right here in my background. And the distribution of this beetle is all over the Eurasian uh, continent, as you can see here. And it's been estimated that it causes over 44 million uh, cubic meters of tree losses every year. So even if we see it from, from the pest's point of view, we also have to think that this is really just a series of very successful adaptations in the terms of ecology. So what is happening is that the spruce bark beetle, Ips typographus, has gained the ability to attack healthy uh, host trees. And these host trees are very heavily chemically defended. But nevertheless, the beetles manage to reproduce inside of the trees. They damage and kill the trees, and then the next cycle continues. And there are up to three generations per year of this beetle. So how is the beetle managing to adapt to such a toxic host tree? Um, one of the top suspects are their fungal ectosymbionts. So these beetles pair up with filamentous fungi from the Ophiostomatide or order. And um, yeah, uh, these fungi help them overcome the tree's defenses and they have been studied for over a hundred years. This symbiosis has been described uh, in the 1920s, but uh, we don't know much about the gut bacteria. And the gut bacteria might be aiding the, the beetle in mediating its relations with this, uh, with this ectosymbionts or it, the gut microbiota might be detoxifying the tree's uh, defenses, or they might be providing some very important nutritional uh, elements. So, so microbial symbioses are everywhere in nature. We find them from associations with plants, with marine animals, also uh, algae and, and corals. In ruminants, we find them with these fantastic fermentation chambers that cows have inside of them. And of course, we also have a very important gut microbiome that contributes to our health. 
Uh, but not only for us, symbiosis are a great driver of build adaptations. And if we stop to think for a moment, insects are the most diverse group of animals in the world. And out of all the insects, over a third of them are beetles, coleopterans. And beetles have associated with many different uh, fungal and bacterial associates to, to thrive and adapt to a very diverse way, um, range of environments. So for example, we have ambrosia beetles that directly farm uh, fungus and, and consume it as a food source. We also have grain pest beetles that have an obligate endosymbiont bacteria that has a very, 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 very tiny genome that is dedicated only to providing the beetle with uh, vitamins or amino acids. We also have some beetles like these boring beetles that live inside of a rotting corpse. <laughs> And they apply their bacteria and yeasts to preserve this food source for their offspring. We also have very interesting pests like the coffee berry borer that harbor a gut microbial community that detoxifies caffeine so they can live inside of the coffee berry. And there's also defensive symbiosis like the case of lagria beetles that smear a protective bacteria on their eggs and this bacteria produces uh, antifungal compounds that defend the eggs from entomopathogens. So in my PhD, I wanted to investigate if the microbial communities change throughout the beetle's life cycle because it goes through metamorphosis and that rearranges everything inside of the beetle. I also wanted to understand if rearing systems affect the, the microbial community composition because a lot of people are working with this insect and we keep them in the lab and we don't know how that is impacting their mi gut microbes. And also as uh, gut microbes can be very important for the adaptation and the survival and the aggressiveness of the pest. I was also very interested in seeing how these beetles manage to acquire their symbionts and also how they pass it on to the next generations. So beetles spend most of their life in the bark. First, uh, the males locate the host, they make a mating chamber, and then they start emitting the sexual pheromone where they attract the females. They mate in this little mating chamber. And then the female starts uh, making a gallery. And what you're going to see now is she's in the end of the gallery. She is laying an egg right there. Then she's going to run super fast to the mating uh, chamber and she's going to turn around. You have to think about it more or less like a parallel parking because she doesn't fit inside of the maternal tube. And then she comes right back and starts covering the egg at full speed. So what I thought is this might be very important for the beetle if it's immediately going back and forth to protect the eggs that she just laid. After laying the eggs, uh, the, the tunnel looks like this. In black is the female beetle. And on the sides, she has carved out the niches where she laid the eggs. And they are, oops, and yeah, and they cover the eggs with this plug that we just saw in the video. Then uh, when the eggs hatch, the larvae start munching their way through the phloem. They create these side galleries away from the maternal gallery. And then in the end of these maternal galleries, they create a little chamber where they pupate. Here we can see the pupa. And then they, uh, after a closure, the beetles look a little bit um, blonde, let's say like this. And then they carry out a matur maturation feeding where they become uh, black and hardened and they fully melanize. So what I did is I sampled all the different life stages I could find in the wild here in Germany. And then in the laboratory rearing, I sampled everything from the egg plug to the mature adults. And I also sampled the maternal and larval galleries and the unattacked adjacent bark. And uh, we carried out a community composition and, and structure study with amplicon sequencing and isolating bacteria from all the different life stages. We measure the, the uh, quantity of microbes in the different environment. And we also try to locate the microbes using fluorescence in situ hybridization microscopy. 
So the first thing we found is that the got uh, the I'm going to guide you a little bit through these plots. So here in blue, you can see the uh, beta diversity of the bark, and it clearly clustered separately from all the beta diversity that is associated to the bill and its environment. So all the different life stages and also what is present in the gallery and the plots. And then I, I looked a little bit inside uh, only the beetle environment, so taking out everything that would be beetle tissue, beetle samples. And you can see that the bark, uh, so the phloem that is not attacked by the beetle, looks very different here in pink to everything that is related to the beetle, everything that the beetle has manipulated. And what we found out is that gamma proteobacteria dominate the community. These gamma proteobacteria are present in the bark, as you can see this, um, especially these taxa, the Ervinia taxa, Aceus antomonas, and Ranella, and they are also present in the different life stages. And when we looked at the laboratory reared beetles, we see that these taxa are also a little bit present in the bark, but then they dominate the whole a bacterial community in the galleries, in the plugs, in the eggs, um, throughout the different life stages, and also in the pupal chamber. Uh, so I did an analysis to try to find out which are the core taxa. So taxa, bacteria that are present in the different life stages, uh, regardless of whether it was wild collected or rare uh, insects. And we found that, in fact, these uh, gamma proteobacteria, the Ervinia, the Seus antomonas, and the Ranella are present in all the life stages. But how about uh, the fungi? Because fungi are also part of the gut community. And we found a similar pattern where you can see here in blue, the bark is clustering different in, in a very different way from the rest of the samples. And here you can see that it clearly separates uh, from the environmental samples that are related to the beetle manipulation, where it constructs its galleries and so on. And we found that surprisingly, the fungal symbionts that we know so much about over the past hundred years, the uh, filamentous fungi, are not the most abundant um, uh, fungi in the gut. And we found that it's mostly yeasts that dominate the community. So especially uh, these taxa that we can see in blue all over the place, also dominating the gallery and a very different composition of what is in the gut and in the build environment from what is in the bark. So, and the same happened with the laboratory reared uh, beetles. They have a little bit uh, more stable community than the ones that are in the wild but it's always these yeasts that dominate the community. So again, I did the same analysis. I found that these four yeasts are dominating the gut community and the environment from the beetle. And with that, I also wanted to see what was happening in the oviposition site with all this manipulation that the female is doing. And we found that the egg plug uh, that the female is putting in in each of the niches to protect the egg is enriched with a lot uh, with a higher fungal load than the egg. So, if you remember, it's these little plugs here, and they are uh, covered or very very enriched with uh, fungi. So we went on to see what the female had a. Uh, in the in the body parts that are in contact with the um, oviposition site where she is carving everything in the bark. And we found with the fluorescence microscopy that in the setae that are present in the fronts of the beetle, so let's imagine like in uh, the forehead of the beetle, there are all these little hairs, the setae, which you can see here in this grayish uh, blue. And then uh, what you see in yellow are yeast cells that are attached to that part. So from this part uh, of my work, I want you to take home two messages. First is that this beetle that is very aggressive harbors a very stable core of yeasts and gamma protobacteria in the gut gallery and their environment throughout their life cycle. These uh, taxa are present throughout different life stages, throughout different seasons, 
And also, even if we take the beetles to the lab and they don't have contact to all the environments they are exposed in the forest. And the data suggests that females transmit part of their microbes uh, to the next generation. So it would be super interesting to understand what the roles of these microbes are for the beetle. Uh, so now we know a little bit more about the transmission and the composition of the gut, bacterial, and fungal communities. But we don't know much about what these uh, microbes are doing for the beetle. So what is known so far from in vitro assays and, and genomic studies is that these bacteria and yeasts are uh, capable of degrading the plant cell wall. So they have silanases, amylases, glucanases, glucosidases, and other um, casines. So enzymes that are able to degrade uh, complex comp uh, carbon compounds. And there are also some of these bacteria that are capable of defending um, the galleries and the beetles against fungal entomopathogens. They can inhibit fungal growth and they have been tested against different strains. The problem is that um, so far we only know this from in vitro and genomic assays. And what would be really, really cool is to know what this really means for the bill, how it's impacting the bill's lifestyle so we can understand the ecology of the bill a bit better and come up with better management tools. So what I've been working on lately is to make an in vitro, well, in vitro validation of the functional roles of the gut microbiota. So I have managed to uh, create axenic bills where I surface sterilize the egg, put them in a semi-artificial diet and obtain adults from this. Then I can also test uh, the egg as it is with the without touching it, uh, without uh, fiddling with the gut microbes. So I can just have the native microbiota. And then I can also reinfect the egg with the cultivated microorganisms that I have, like a mock community. So I go on, I peel these logs, I collect the eggs. I place a newly hatched larva in each of these little tubes. And after waiting for six weeks, I managed to obtain a fully grown adult that has been reared in the semi-artificial conditions, uh, fully outside of the log. So we can now have access to a system that we can manipulate and put the microbes in, take the microbes out and see what they're really doing for the beetle. Uh, the only thing is that now I have to improve a little bit the percentage of surviving adults so I can make this uh, bioassay more efficient. So yeah, the next step is developing these in vitro assays to really understand what the gut microbiome is doing for the beetle. So with this, I want to end. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of being this. It was an honor to be invited here. And I want to thank everyone who has helped me along the way, in the technical part and the scientific part, and also the funding of my doctoral school. Wow, Anna, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And the work itself was really beautiful. And I see that it is already in press. So congratulations for taking that into publication stage as well. That's, that's really, really great work. Thank um, you. So I'll, I'll start off with a question, but I'm sure there, there'll be many. Um, it's, it's a fascinating system. And uh, the microbes and how they interact with organisms is quite hard to study, but definitely an uh, area where people are looking more into it. And so do you think that this could then be the next control, the control strategy? So if you want to control these people, do you control the fact that microbes are only the state? I think we're still very far from developing an applied strategy for this because we can't just release, let's say, antibiotics into the environment. And it's it's still let's say we're still learning just from the ecology, so this is not applied to measurements in control, but I do believe that the more we know about the associated uh, microbes of this beetle, the more we can develop targeted tools in the future. So let's imagine if we go wild, now we could be thinking of uh, interference RNA that would target the specific microbial strains that uh, are associated with this beetle, and then we could really have a very targeted approach. But this is really futuristic. Right now, I'm not doing any applied work. 
but I do think that uh, understanding the ecology more can give us an insight of of the whole life cycle of this virus and maybe get a better insight on how to manage it. Right. And I, and I just have one technical question quickly with these um, this type of analysis where you're only doing sequence based of the microbial community. They have, um, there have been cases where not all the microbes have been amplified correctly because you're targeting an ITS region, for example, and you haven't used any culture based approaches. So do you think yeah. that um, are covering? I, I, I didn't show it here, but we have I have isolated the gamma proteobacteria. It's the most frequent. Yeah, the thing is, on the interest of time, I didn't include it. But I have these bacteria from all the different life stages, and a colleague of mine is working more on the yeast side. So we also have all the yeast isolates. Um, uh, happily for us, there were also other labs working on this system. Last year, there were a lot of publications on this system. And it's really cool to see that the same microbes are present all over Europe under different conditions. So now we are working together to see if we can do like a microbe network analysis now that we have data from all over uh, the continent. Great, thanks. Now, it's going to be great to see how this research progresses. So well done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Alyssa Martino. So Alyssa is a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. Uh, she's studying the molecular basis of resistance for the fungal pathogen Arthrocoxidiae psidiae. Her research has focused on developing a model system using the broadly paperback tree to investigate the host response to this pathogen. Uh, it is anticipated that this model will provide methods and molecular markers for future research on disease risk uh, resistance in the to this pathogen. So you can share your screen. Thank you. Okay, I'll just make sure you can see that okay. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today. It's a real um, pleasure to be here. So I wanted to talk today about our work with Melaleuca quinquinervia um, and particularly how we're trying to use this as a bit of a model um, organism for investigating the genetic basis of resistance to myrtle rust. So I'm based at the University of Sydney um, and I am a PhD student there sort of in the final stages. So Anna already gave a fantastic introduction um, to myrtle rust. So I'm hoping um, that there's not too much repetition here. Um, but myrtle rust is the disease caused by the fungal pathogen Osteopraxinia sidii. It originated in South America where it was causing significant impact on eucalyptus plantations. That was when it was realized that it was a a potentially large threat um, to the Australian ecosystem, which is dominated by Myrtaceae. And unfortunately, it was detected in Australia in 2010. One of the challenges um, with myrtle rust is that it spreads really easily because of the copious amounts of spores that it produces. So it spreads easily through wind, um, through human movement, and also pollinators. As a result of that, what we have seen is widespread um, of myrtle rust across the east coast of Australia and even into WA, like Anna showed previously. Um, and the only state of Australia that's currently free of myrtle rust is South Australia. So the disease impacts species within the family Motaceae. This is um, our paper barks, eucalyptus, bottle brushes, lily pillies, and tea trees, just as some examples. And the host range is incredibly large, which is quite unusual, unusual for a rust pathogen. Um, but so far, we have a host range of about 370 um, Australian species. And many of these hosts have really significant ecological importance. They're food sources for many of our beautiful animals here in Australia. Um, and they're also important as homes. They have a lot of cultural and cultural and spiritual significance to the Indigenous people of Australia, 
And they're also economically valuable when it comes to paper and pulp, um, tea tree oil as an example, so essential oils, and also for honey production from, um, from the flowers. Repeated infections lead to tree death. And so we have seen localized extinction of several key species in Australia. And because of this really broad host range that we have, um, we don't have any model systems to be working with in understanding the genetic response to the pathogen. So when I started my PhD, this became very apparent and we wanted to start working towards a model system to understand this genetic basis of resistance to the pathogen. So we started working with Melaleuca quinquinervia, which is a broadleaf paperbark. It's widely distributed across the east coast of Australia, and there's many characteristics that make it really useful for us to be using as a model. We can propagate it very easily from cuttings, and it grows really easily from seed as well. This seed um, is available all year round, so we can always be going back to trees to collect more seed. They germinate really easy without any specific requirements. And most importantly, from a genetic perspective, they show this variable response to Osteopraxinia sidii. So what we can see here on the left-hand side um, is this flecking response, which is typified, um, is typical of the hypersensitive response, which we know there's a genetic basis to that form of resistance, all the way through to highly susceptible here on the right-hand side, where we can see that the, the host isn't responding to the presence of the pathogen at all. So we're really interested in understanding what that difference is genetically um, between these highly resistant and these highly susceptible hosts. Uh, the first step in doing this was to generate a high quality genome for the Melaleuca quinquinervia. Um, for a lot of these tree species, we don't have the genomic resources. So this was our first step. We next wanted to annotate the repertoire of disease resistance genes that existed with this, within this genome. And we also wanted to look at other Melaleuca quinquinervia to understand um, if we could understand the genes or pathways that were leading to this resistance response. We've then extended this to screen other Melaleuca species for their response to the pathogen. And then we wanted to interrogate if these Melaleuca species also contain the same genes that we identified in Melaleuca quinquinevia. So just start off quickly um, by talking about the genome that we generated for Melaleuca quinquinevia. So for anyone um, that has worked with genomes before, you will probably be familiar with them in their collapsed form. So when we're talking about an organism such as the broadleaf paperbark, we're talking about a diploid organism. And so we have two sets of parental chromosomes. And usually when this is presented just for ease, this is collapsed into one, um, into one sequence. Unfortunately, what happens when we do that is that we lose a lot of the information about the allelic diversity that exists within that organism. So what we did was we sequenced a tree that was resistant to myrtle rust in controlled inoculations. And we've used that genome to aid in the identification of resistance genes. And what this has allowed us to do um, is have a look at the diversity that exists in these genes um, within the broadleaf paperbark. The family of resistance genes that we were looking at um, are the nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat genes. And these genes are incredibly important, if not one of the most important families of resistance genes um, in plants. And they encode proteins that will detect pathogen effectors. So they're responsible for detecting the small molecules that are secreted by by pathogens um, and they mediate a host response. And that's where we get that hypersensitive response and that flecking that we saw on the leaves earlier. They're highly variable in their sequences. So we can see here on the N-terminal domain, we have variation in, um, in this. So we can either have a, for simplicity, we'll call it a CC or a TIR domain. 
we have a central MBR domain, which is highly conserved, um, and also a variable LLR domain also. Some of these genes will also contain integrated domains, and these are of particular interest to us because these can almost act as baits for pathogen effectors, because what they will do is mimic genes on the host genome, um, and the pathogen effectors will bind to these domains, and then instead of um, being able to infect the host, they actually trigger this downstream resistance response. So when we interrogated the Melaleukaquinquinevia genome, um, we found over 1,400 of these genes, which is very large when we consider that the genome itself is only 300 megabases. And what we also saw was a large expansion of these TIR type of NLRs, which have been implicated in rust resistance in the past. 9% of these genes um, contained those novel integrated domains, those ones that are acting as baits for effector proteins as well. So from here, um, we wanted to actually analyze whether or not any of these genes were expressed in response to infection with Osteopuxinia sidii. So to go about that, we collected seed from the tree that we used to generate the genome. And fortunately, the response when we inoculated these plants that were the progeny from this tree was this differential response that we saw earlier. So what this has allowed us to do um, is in artificial conditions is to inoculate these plants with the pathogen and have a look at any transcriptome differences that exist between these resistant and susceptible plants. We did this as early as six hours post inoculation um, because we know that the pathogen is already um, germinating on the host by this early time point. And so we really wanted to try and capture that. And what's important to note here as well was that prior to our, um, our analyses, these plants hadn't been exposed to the pathogen before. Our findings were really interesting. Um, we found that the resistant and susceptible plants, when we looked at the, um, the transcriptomes between these two plants, um, sorry, these two um, phenotypes, we saw that there was a clear distinction with the clustering of the expressed genes between the resistant that we can see here um, and the susceptible plants. And so this was prior to inoculation and prior to any exposure to Osteopuxinia sidii, which indicates to us that perhaps these genes um, that are underpinning resistance may actually already be constitutively expressed. And we may be able to use this as a, um, as a type of fingerprint as well when we're looking for resistant and susceptible plants. This was also observed in other interactions, so with Syzygium lumanii as an example. We also detected expression changes very early on, as early as six hours post-inoculation. Um, and what we've also seen is that there's a large shift in gene expression at 12 hours post-inoculation. What we were particularly interested in um, was the expression of several of these NLR genes. So we found three of these genes upregulated um, in our resistant plants as uh, compared to our susceptible plants. These were all located on a single chromosome, so chromosome eight, and they were occurring within clusters of these genes as well, which you can see in the map here. When we looked at um, the sequences of these genes, we saw that they shared sequence similarity with known disease resistance genes, um, and these were conferring resistance to powdery mildew and downy mildew. So while this is um, still very preliminary in our findings, we wanted to test um, whether or not we can be expanding this to other Melaleuca species. As Anna mentioned before, um, metal rust hasn't spread extensively through Western Australia, 
And part of the work that we're doing is trying to understand the risk that exists for Western Australia. So what I've done so far, um, and this is still a work in progress, but we've screened 16 Melaleuca species from Western Australia for their resistance to Australopraxinia sidii. And while we found no to low levels of resistance in some of these species, we have seen in many of them that we do have this differential response, especially in other broadleaf paper barks like the Melaleuca argentia. So what we would like to test here um, is whether or not any of these genes have um, any orthologs or homologs within the um, other Melaleuca species that we've tested. And if we do find any of these genes that are present within these plants, um, we plan to test them for their expression differences. So that is where we're at at the moment. Um, and we're hoping to be able to round some of this work off in the next couple of months. So I just wanted to thank um, everyone that was involved in this project, especially the collaborators on the genome and my supervisors um, and all of the funding bodies for the work as well. So thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, do we have any questions from the floor or from online? Mark, so I just so you looked at the genetic resistance of the plants to the pathogen. Is yes. anyone, the vice versa, the, the infection of the pathogen to the plant host? Yeah, there's definitely work going on in that space. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have when we're looking at the interaction is that there's such low... Um, the ratio of host to pathogen is um, is incredibly low on the pathogen side. So getting meaningful data on the pathogen, especially at those early time points, when we know that there's not much really happening, um, it's really challenging to try and narrow down those effectors. So there's a lot of work in other species, so um, wheat rust as an example, and I think there's a lot that we can take away from that and try to apply in, in the myrtle rust space, but it's definitely a work in progress in other groups around Australia. It's, it's challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rust and working well, with rust, rust, yeah. Yes, they're, yeah, they're incredibly challenging. I started off a lifetime ago in Arabidopsis. So working in non-model organisms has been a learning curve. <laughs> um, do we have any more questions from the floor? Please raise your hand groups. Um, is there anyone in the chat? Right. Okay, thanks. I think then we can move on to our last speaker. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Lisa. So our last speaker is Professor Jessa Utter. She is an associate professor working within the Department of Forest Biological Sciences at the University of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And she is currently using genetic information and genomic methods to better understand how tree pathogenic fungi and their microbial symbionts interact with their host trees, but at the same time while adapting to different environmental changes. So she is trying to predict patterns of disease spread. She's looking at functions of microbes in healthy versus disease ecosystems. And she's developing molecular tools to identify these tree pathogens. So a quite exciting space. Thank you, Jessa. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. All right, um, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, that's good. Awesome. All right, so yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Irene. Um, hello, everyone. It's, it's late afternoon here in the Philippines, so good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Jessa. I am a forest pathologist and an associate professor here at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about some of the research studies uh, highlighting also women's work um, that we're working on here in our lab to understand the interactions of fungi and trees for the conservation and sustainable use of forest resources in the Philippines. 
So why conservation and sustainable use? Well, it's because the Philippines is a biodiversity hotspot. So just to recap, biodiversity hotspot means that one, the region has a high percentage of plant endemism um, or plants found nowhere else in the world. And second, the region has lost about 70% of its primary native vegetation. And of course, the Philippines hits both of those criteria. Um, the Philippines is one of the mega diverse countries in the world, as you can see here in this map. So we do have very high species richness and very high species endemism, but we have only 7.2 million hectares left of forest cover from about 30 million hectares in the past. And by the way, I will also be featuring some of these forests um, through photos throughout my presentation, so check them out. So yeah, again, going back, um, the country is mega diverse, but um, this high biodiversity is significantly threatened by habitat loss. Um, deforestation is at its fastest rate, might have slowed down a little bit during the past few years, um, but still um, it resulted to at least 700 threatened species and several of these are critically endangered. So this puts the Philippines in the map among the 35 to 36 biodiversity hotspots that had been identified worldwide, as you can see in this map. So like I said earlier, the Philippines do have high biodiversity, but unfortunately for fungi, we only have limited records of these species. And most of the records are focused only on macrofungi. These are basically those fungal species that produce relatively large fruiting bodies. And there are about 5,000 species of macrofungi that have been recorded across diverse tropical forest formations in the Philippines. And a huge chunk of that belongs to Basidio mycota that is dominated by polypores and 15% of these recorded macrofungi belong to Ascomycota. Now, what I'm really interested in are those fungal species, which can either be macro or microfungi that cause diseases in forestry species. And based on past records collected from different regions in the Philippines, majority of the forest pathogens belong to kingdom fungi. And while many of these fungal pathogens can cause, leaf, uh, can cause diseases in various parts of the tree, majority of um, these pathogens cause diseases on leaves of these trees. Unfortunately, though, to put it simply, we don't really know much about these fungal pathogens, but with the increasing emergence of forest diseases worldwide, plus the continued decline of forested areas in the Philippines, we got to need to get more inf information about these diseases and fungal pathogens. So to manage forest diseases in fragmented Philippine forests, there's really a need to increase awareness on fungal pathogen taxonomy, biology, trophic lifestyles, and interactions. And uh, so to answer that, um, the research in my lab focuses mainly on three themes. First is on identification of tree pathogens using morphological and molecular traits to improve accuracy of disease diagnosis. Second is on characterizing microbial communities in host trees to understand microbial functions and interactions. And lastly, on determining or evaluating strategies that would minimize the impact of forest diseases, as well as promote sustainable integrated pest management. And the goal really is to use all of these information for the development of efficient forest disease management that will be helpful for the conservation and sustainable use of basically what remains of our forest resources here in the country. And so today I'm gonna to highlight two research studies that looked into the interactions of fungal pathogens with two endangered forest species in the Philippines. And the first stop is the occurrence of a new foliar disease on areca ipot. Um, areca ipot is a um, species under family Arecaceae. It's a Philippine endemic species of palm. Basically it's, no, it's found nowhere else in the world, but only in the Philippines, um, but it's categorized by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as endangered, primarily due to habitat loss. This species is largely understudied, yet overly poached for various uses, but there's a small population of the species that is currently sheltered at the palmetum of the University of the Philippines Los Banos land grant and their propagules raised in the in-house nursery. But in December of 2022, a severe outbreak of a new leaf spot disease was observed on Areca Ipot seedlings, um, basically killing all of these um, seedlings in the nursery. The disease starts with just small leaf spots that coalesce until all of the leaves are dead. 
So what we did it was to collect infected leaf samples and studied in the lab and in the greenhouse. And uh, most of the results that I'm showing here today, I'm proud to say, are from the work of my student, um, Romana Mastrelli. And so what we found is basically two groups of isolates based on morphology. The first morphotype, or morphotype 1, has these morphological characteristics, um, white cottony aerial mycelium with black canidiomata and fusoid canidia. And these are distinct traits among species belonging to pestilatoid complex, and in this case, um, particularly under the genus Neopestilichopsis. And this taxonomic identification was verified through molecular analysis using the combination of three gene loci, um, ITS, EF1 alpha, and beta tubulin. The phylogenetic analysis, um, the phylogenetic analysis showed that uh, this species clustered together with other Neopestilichopsis species, and thus uh, verifying that this pathogen indeed belong to genus Neopestilichopsis. And uh, the pathogenicity assay also proved the ability of this Neopestilichopsis um, species to cause disease on Ereca ibot. And that's basically the same story with morphotype 2. Based on these morphological characteristics, like white aerial mycelium with reddish brown color at the backside or the reverse side of the plate, and cylindrical um, macroconidia with rounded ends, we identified these isolates as a Calinectria species. And this was also verified through molecular analysis, again, using the combined sequences of ITS, EF1 alpha, and beta tubulin. The phylogenetic analysis um, showed clustering of this species with a group that's mostly composed of plant pathogenic Calinectria species in forestry, um, in forestry crops. And we were also able to complete the pathogenicity assay, um, basically proving the pathogenicity of this Calinectria species. So taking all these things together, um, this study, to the best of our knowledge, is the first report of the two fungal pathogens, Neopestilichopsis and Calinectria species, that cause um, disease on Areca ibot. And there's likely more of these cases out there, especially on endangered forest species here in the country. So we're really hoping to make use of a combination of morphological and molecular tools to identify under, um, under, undescribed fungal pathogens or those identified solely based on morphological descriptions or classified using outdated taxonomic heats. This will not only facilitate the understanding of fungal diversity, but it will also help strengthen phytosanitary measures. So that's the first study that I wanted to highlight. Now I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about a different type of interaction between fungal pathogens, sort of different um, type of interaction between fungal pathogens and trees. And I'm talking about this, this second study on fungal communities involved in agarwood formation. So agarwood refers to this fragrant, dark, resinous wood that is formed in the heartwood of Achillaria tree species. So this is just one of the eight Achillaria species recorded here in the country. Now, agarwood formation serves as a defense mechanism when trees are wounded and then infected by microorganisms, primarily fungi. So this um, agarwood is generally used for the production of a wide variety of economically important products like oil, perfume, cosmetic products, incense, and herbal medicines. And uh, so the market value really of agarwood and the demand for its products have increased tremendously over the years. But of course, it comes with a cost, especially that uh, the bulk of agarwood has been derived from the wild or natural populations. So these trees... Uh, in the Philippines, like elsewhere, are often overexploited and traded illegally. And because of this, um, these species are in the IUCN list of critically endangered species and also in the list of um, critically uh, endangered species in the under the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES. Now, in natural populations, agarwood is produced in trees at about 15 years old. The older the trees, basically, it gets um, the more agarwood it contains. So it really takes time and really puts a lot of pressure in native Achillaria populations. So for our research, we aim to identify native agarwood forming microbes in Achillaria species in the Philippines that will be artificially inoculated to successfully induce agarwood formation in relatively young Achillaria plantations. And this project is led by my colleague, Dr. Lerma Maldia, and is supported by agencies 
under the Department of Science and Technology and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources here in the Philippines. And we really envision this as a part is as a project that's part of a long-term program that will facilitate the optimization and development of technology for faster and sustainable agrowood production while conserving native Achillaria populations in the Philippines. And we just started this project, the very baby, uh, last year. It's just an infant project. Um, and this project is um, conducted also with one of our um, grad students, um, Clarice Maravilla. She's primarily doing the work on cultivable endophytic fungi. And uh, our initial findings show that infected wood of at least one Achillaria population in the Philippines harbors a diversity of endophytic fungi that could potentially induce agarwood formation. And uh, this fungal community is dominated by, um, uh, by likely dominated by species under the genera Fus um, Fusarium, Trichoderma, and Aspergillus. Um, and obviously, there's still really a long way to go for this research, but um, we're really aiming to explore further the potential of these microbes for large-scale production of agarwood in young um, Achillaria plantations. And we also hope that this project um, will help jumpstart more research to assess microbial diversity in native tree species in unique forest ecosystems here in the Philippines to help us understand and harness their diverse ecological roles. And of course, we're very much open for international collaborations on different aspects of forest pathology research. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my small, very young team of budding researchers. I would also like to thank my Hope Institution, our collaborators, and to IFRO um, for giving us this opportunity to share research with you guys, and of course, to all of you for listening. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jessa. That was uh, nice to see the work that you're starting to work with. And um, so yeah, it's, it's really good to look at the biodiversity there is in the native environment and also the threats that there might be on forest plantations and vice versa. For example, we know that Catanectria is an important disease of eucalyptus, for example, that's grown for plantation purposes. And so there has been quite a bit of work done to characterize the different Calinectria species on a global scale that's affecting eucalyptus. So do you think that yours is a new species? And um, is it a new species? Have I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, it, I was actually also thinking of like showing it to you guys at Tavi, so maybe you guys could also check it out. But um, What's interesting is that I tried to have some more, like it was ITS at first and then um, two gene loci, but it was not really conclusive of what species that is. So um, maybe it, it may be a new species, so, but we're still working on it. We're hoping that we could, if they are, if it is really a new species, then maybe um, we could describe it further and name it. Okay, no, that would be good. It will be good to know what's in the Philippines as well. And um, I can share some recent publications. Uh, yeah, in taxonomy yeah. might help you actually with, with the taxonomy of that. So it could help. That would, that would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, do we have any other questions? Uh, anybody raising their hands? Okay. Good, good, Jessa. All right, so I um, want to take this opportunity to really um, thank all the phenomenal women that we have had the privilege to hear today, their presentations, which were really, really great. And uh, I, I want to thank you for that. And it's a pity that um, some people might have missed the online session. But the good news is that all of these talks will be available on YouTube, so we can spread the word and let others also have a look at that. And in the last word, I just want to say that uh, we have the IUFRA World Conference happening in Sweden in June. So I'm really hoping that I will and we will see each other, network and meet each other at this conference. So thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Until next time.